owns several properties and he told me he doesn't want to deal with single family. He buys multi-unit houses in areas where people are going to school there, like USC, UCLA, and he gets them, renovates them, and he just rents them for for future. So he's doing really good as a cash cow. He just rents them out. Yeah, that's awesome. It is. I thought I'd share that with you. So I'm in to to um, join you guys in and listen to what you have to say. Cool. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, Ed. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, Amelia, how you doing? Good. How are things going? Doing well. Hello. Awesome. There aren't many people uh, on the call yet. We'll see. Uh, see how many people uh, we get. We get uh, usually we get one or two people straggling in here. Hey Ed, so the uh, the property analysis that I'm looking at, this is going to yeah. cover that today. That's uh, for multi-unit. Is that what it is, or? So you can use it either way. Uh, it's for here. Let me share with the screens. And Joseph, you. Uh, by the way, Joseph, there, there's a Facebook group that corresponds to this class. This this investor group. Um, hold uh, on. Sure. sure. You want me to throw a picture on the show? Hold on a second here. I'll. Uh, if you want to, uh, Joseph, here's the uh, link to the. Facebook group. And it'll always be the same link, correct, Ed? Yeah, the, the, the Facebook groups are gonna always be the same. And so while I'm here, here, let me share my screen because I'm gonna show you guys the, the template that we're gonna use today, you can find it. It's, I mean, I, Amelia, I emailed it to you, but you can also find it on the, so here's the here's the uh, Facebook page, right? If you go under Files, uh, Working on Wealth Investment Template, this is it right here. Okay. And awesome. then these are some samples that we've done uh, in in using this class. Uh, by the way, there's also in here a net worth tracker that's really good. Um, there's a simple version and an advanced one, as you can see here. Um, that's also something that we recommend doing as well. Hey, Hope, how you doing? Good to have you. Doing good, thank you. So we're, we'll get we're going to get into, into uh, analyzing an investment property here soon. Um, just how to do that from scratch. Uh, but before we do, as you guys know, uh, one thing we always like to start off every week is to see if anybody has anything to report. Fi uh, financially, like what's going on in your financial life? Uh, any lessons learned? Any like, you know, something you had to major expense, you know, whatever, anything that's that's helpful. Well, um, I can say I uh, learned this along the way. It's good to have a multi-unit, maybe more than two or three, just in case if you acquire it and you're renting it, you won't be without a renter. In this case, uh, renters are leaving and they're not, uh, resigning leases, so best to have at least more than two or three, just in case one or two um, tenants leave. At least you have at least one or two, maybe to, to pay for your rent. Cool, I love that. Anybody else? That's what that's what I thought on top of my head. That's that's a safety net. Hope Amelia, anything report? Uh, I was I was waiting for Joseph to kind of finish up, but yeah, I mean a couple of things. I mean, just uh, you know, going into the first quarter, one of the things that I wanted to do is free up cash flow, right? And by my goal is that by the mid mid year, I'll be completely, you know, all my all the all the income that I get from real estate is going to go right back into reinvesting, right? I won't have to pay other than my living expenses. I won't have to pay any extra. Right. So whether it be a car payment, credit cards, whatever that case may be. Yeah. Kind of what I'm working through this this quarter. So we took a big chunk, you know, to the to the point where we're a thousand dollars more more free on cash flow. Yeah, uh, that's that was a huge thing for us in first quarter. And then um, the second thing that we're looking at in the second part of the year is looking to invest internationally uh, for Verbos in, uh, in an island called Santa Marta in Colombia. So we'll be taking a visit there at the end of the year. And then starting to look at those as uh, viable options for investment opportunities. That's really cool. That's neat. I, I've never I've never done anything outside of the country. So that's uh, yeah. Well, as you go through that process, I'd love to hear about it. So please come back and, and share more about it. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And then through this call, I mean, I just you know um, the the uh, the Zoom Casa has been a big, huge uh, 
conversation starter with uh, with door knocking, right? So yeah. I, I have an opportunity, not necessarily that's going to be, well, I would go through Zoom Casa for the reno and then buy before you, you, you sell, right? So I have a pending appointment for that to, to use Zoom Casa uh, and then we would list and then help them uh, purchase so, or purchase and then list, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that's 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 really cool. Um, yeah, uh, love that. Any anybody else? Anyone want to share anything? I've got something to share too. Miguel, anything from you? Hope. Uh, nothing today. Cool. Um, here's something for me. So uh, I thought I'd share this with you guys. Uh, you know, not to get all personal or anything, but I, I just thought it'd be interesting. I thought you guys would. It's it's a neat kind of. I don't know. I find it interesting. And, uh, but anyways, my, my wife and I, you know, she, she's been a hairstylist for a long time. She actually makes really good money doing it. She used to do like uh, celebrity hair in Beverly Hills and stuff like that. Uh, she, she used to make more money than me for a long time. And um, when the pandemic hit, she couldn't work. And then along the way, so then we were collecting unemployment, which was actually nice. And then my daughter started having some issues long. It's a long story, but, uh, the, the short of it is, is that she, uh, we had to take her out of school and she's homeschooling now. Long story. Don't, don't worry about it. But th that's just the circumstance I'm in right now. It's just, and, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And so, you know, first of all, luckily, like I, I make enough that we can live off of my income. So that's, that's cool. Um, but like, I, I really wanted to push ahead. And one of the things that we teach in this class that, uh, it, so again, for those of you who don't know, we've been reading through this book here, Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Uh, we're kind of like two thirds of the way through it right now. Um, we're not going to touch on it today because today we're going to talk about uh, analyzing investments. But one of the first things that that Gary Keller recommends in that book is that a couple things: start tracking your net worth, and don't just like do it once as like an exercise of like how much is my net worth. The real power is when you start doing it at least on a monthly basis, if not even on a weekly basis, which sounds crazy at first, but once you do it once or twice, you can actually get it done in about 10 minutes. Like literally it's that fast, especially by the way, if you use Quicken or something like that or, and Quick, Quicken and QuickBooks together, honestly, usually it's just a matter of just like going on there and just pushing a few buttons for a saved report and you can have it in five minutes. Um, so Gary recommends doing that on a, on a month, uh, at least a monthly basis, if not a weekly basis. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there is a there is a uh, template for doing so that's on the Facebook group. So if you want, you can grab that. There's many of them out there, but there's one that you can use that's on the Facebook group that I, I think is really good. That one comes from Ben Guinea, Ben Kinney uh, from the website Win Make Give, and he also has a podcast. We'll probably once we finish the MRI book, we'll probably go into that podcast and stuff. There's some really really cool stuff in there. Anyways, uh, I digress. The point I was making is that because I've been tracking this stuff every week and every month, you know, first thing I was like, oh shit, like we need to free up some cash flow because we're like, we're negative right now. And so we, we, we refinanced both of our cars like a couple months ago when it was really good. And, you know, we, we basically just extended out alone. My, my, my Beamer's almost paid off and we're like, well, shit, you know, because we're tight right now, it's not like, I don't care if we owe Five thousand dollars. The cars. It's it's never going to be upside down. It's it's, you know. So why why if we're having trouble right now, let's just extend out the loan fucking as long as possible. Uh, who cares? It's the money so cheap right now. Just so we can keep our payments low, because I want to I want to stay cash flow positive. And then while we're so we refinance both cars, that freed up like six hundred dollars worth of of cash flow, which is cool. Like now we have a little. We're we're a little bit back in the in the black, so we're not. We're, we're not spending negative, but, you know, we're not, we're not getting, and our, and our goal was to buy a house by the end of this year. And I'm like, we're not, we're not getting closer to that goal. Now, you know, it's a temporary thing that hopefully is going to clear up here in the next year or two. So I could just, we could just tread water where we're at right now, but I was thinking like, well, shit. I mean, you know, part of me doing my job that I have now at, at Keller Williams South Bay is I can't really do much sales because I just, I can't, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, my job is to take care of the office and I don't have the, I don't have the time to do that much, but you know, my wife and I were like, shit, she used to have a real estate license. We used to, 
on the East Coast, we did, we had a team together. That's that's how I got into this. And we're like, shit, she could probably get her license. For, I could help her get her license for free. And, you know, I have, I still have like five to 10 deals that just fall in my lap every year. She could do most of like the legwork on that. And then I could just do all the, the technical work on, you know, evenings or on the weekend. And we could do four deals a year and be making far more than she's making now. So, um, you know, I, I'm sharing that with you guys. It's kind of personal, but I just, just so you guys can know, like some of the power that happens when you track on a weekly and monthly basis, you just start, you start to be, you start to get, you have goals and you start to realize what's going on. You have more visibility into what's going on in the moment and it, it frees you up to make decisions. And all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not so stuck. Shit, I could do this or that. And, and all, you have more, you have more things you can move around than you ever thought you could. Right. Um, so I, I just thought I'd share with you guys because I thought that was interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, to, to, to your point, I'm doing uh, I'm doing a PL review Mondays and Fridays, right? That's kind of my, yeah. my thing from, uh, you know, half an hour each of those days. And I'm just plugging in and you're able to see, you know, based on your projected numbers that you're going to do for the year, where we're at in October, quarter, you know, Q3, Q4. Right? Yeah. So now, to your point, we're looking we're looking to do the same thing. We're debating whether should we invest in a property? Like I said, Santa Marta is an option. Do we want to buy a property for ourselves right now? Or do we want to just live the RV life and buy an RV and travel, you know, and maybe buy yeah. do that option, right? But you're able to then look at those things ahead of time and, and prepare and plan for that. And that's the you know, that was my share uh, at the beginning of the call, right? Freeing up a thousand dollars worth of cash flow a month is just a relief on uh, off, off my shoulders a little bit, right? Yeah. You know, we had we had a nest egg saved up. And I'm like, well, the money's not doing for us anything for us there. Might as well use that to pay off some things that we have that don't need to be there. Yeah. You know, luckily the business and real estate is going well. So it's, you know, it allows for us to do those type of things. Right. So it's good. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, really cool stuff. Can I share something with you? I have a friend that's, that I've known for maybe the last 15, 20, uh, maybe more than 15 years. Um, he's doing part-time retail and, part-time real estate and he just told me fine it's amazing he just told me that yesterday that he's cut off his retail and he's going full-time and he's dedicating himself full-time in the real estate so i think that was good cool cool right on um okay so let's do this uh by the way quick note so in in you know we're, we're going to analyze the property today from scratch i'll walk you guys through it from start to finish um interestingly uh Bef right before this call, I walked over to uh, to Chris Rivera from LendUS, and I said, "Hey, you know, give give me a ballpark figure. What what are the interest rates right now for an investor?" This is what I told him. I said, "Investor who has 800 credit score, putting down 25 percent on a multifamily property that where they're not going to live in one of the units. You know, what's like what's like a good ballpark interest rate to, for us to use as like uh, uh, what that rate would go for right now?" And he said it'd be about four. 4.6 to 4.75 percent uh and as you guys know we've been doing this for six months here analyzing a property every now and then and uh that's a lot different from what we were saying three months ago uh so that's going to affect a lot of numbers so as we go through today and and uh analyze a property that will probably have some bearing on on what we're up to right um anyways okay so let's do this here so let me share my screen so first thing I'm going to do is we're going to, we're going to find a property. Again, some of you guys got here late. There is a Facebook group that corresponds to this investor group that you're in. If you want to join the Facebook group, I put the, the link in the, in the chat. So you should find it there. If you don't see it there, let me know and I'll, I'll add it again. Um, if you want to join. Um, okay. So here's the screen. And so all the, the under files, Working on this is the working on wealth wealth investment template. This is updated. This is good to go. And there's also some net worth trackers down here. There's some other cool stuff here from some other classes along the way. Anyways, um, okay. So let me go back in here. Where was I? Oh, okay. So let's. So I'm on the MLS. I'm just looking on the map somewhere in here. There's a bunch of properties. These are all multi multifamily properties with three to four units. Um, I just chose those because what, why not? Um, and these are all active. So let's analyze something here, see what we're dealing with. 
In fact, let's look on the map. I want to find something fun to do. But let's go in San Pedro. Let's find, let's find something fun to analyze in San Pedro. I'm trying, I'm trying to find something that's like a little on the higher end side. Maybe what I'll do is, you know what I'm doing? I'm gonna, let me go to, I'll do duplexes as well. Sometimes you find some really, let's, let's look in San Pedro at some duplexes in San Pedro. In fact, I'm just gonna do just duplexes. That first one's sitting on the market for a 165. And then 100 and second street's been on. Oh the yeah, this one here, yeah. yeah. All right, let's take a look. Let's, let's, let's have some fun with this one. So here we got this unit here. Let's take a look. What are we dealing with? How many units is this one? Is it, so yeah, duplex, right? In Manhattan Beach. Is that about four blocks from the beach? Oh, it's got washer and dryer. Okay, so that I can, I'm already seeing about about a hundred thousand dollars worth of renovation, right? Wouldn't you guys say? I mean, new kitchen, new flooring. And this is a uh, fully vacant duplex is an opportunity for investor or owner user to purchase a multifamily property in the heart of Manhattan Beach, California. The property consists of a mix of two, two, of two, two bed, two bath units. Both have identical floor plan and boast a full kitchen, ensuite washer, dryer, wood burning fireplace, balconies, patios, views of the ocean. Each unit has, has an Anderson glass doors installed in the back bedroom deck and, and the property has been newly painted. The ground floor has one has two large one car garages with new doors and additional driveway space. The garages also have extra space for additional storage rooms. So that's part of the problem on this thing is that each unit only has one garage, which we don't get to see pictures of it, I take it. Yeah, no pictures of the garage, okay. So here's their pro forma of what they, you know, what they assume rent is going to go for. All right, so let's let's start uh, let's start plugging away some numbers here. All right, so here is the template. So again, let's take a look at this template here. So you know, in these white areas you you punch you just punch in numbers and then the yellow areas get get calculated with formulas there's also a whole second page which gets very in depth um we'll talk more about that as we go uh the second page by the way is where all the magic happens that, this is where it tells you how how do we think this thing is going to perform over time it's all blank right now because i haven't plugged anything in and then it also there's a third page that has interest calculations the third page i've never even really touched the magic happens on the, the magic happens the bottom line here on the first page and then seeing what happens over time with your investment. Okay, so this uh, let's analyze this one here. So let me first let me duplicate this file. Save as. This is 520 Manhattan Beach Boulevard. Okay, 520 Manhattan Beach, Manhattan Beach, okay. List price is 2850. Let's assume for the moment 
that fair market value is the same thing. Some of you guys be wondering, well, what's the difference? And then by the way, there's also, what is the purchase price? So what are we, why are there three different prices? Anyone wanna take a stab at that? What, what's the difference between list price, fair market value and purchase price? List price is obviously what we, what we're seeing right now, right? Uh, what's listed on the MLS, fair market value is what maybe if you're doing comparables, right? And maybe, you know, you, you average it out, it's maybe 2.3 in the area. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? And then purchase price is what you get for the property, actual, actual purchase price, right? Yeah, exactly right, Amelia. So uh, just, to, just to beat a dead horse here, um, which is a horrible saying, but anyways, list price, people can list properties at whatever. I could list, if, if this was my home, could I list it at $10 million? Sure, of course. Yeah. yeah, right? We can list whatever the hell we want. Does that mean it's worth $10 million? No. So, so list price is whatever some other agent decided to put the property on the market at. That's, that's what it's listed at, right? Fair market is doing my calculations. What do I think this place should go for on the market right now, right? And because it's been on the market for 165 days, has it had price drops? Well, we'll check in that in a minute. Uh, but if it hasn't had price drops, I can pretty much assume that it's overpriced because in this market, it's pretty hard to have a property on the market for that long um, if, if it's anything near a realistic price, right? Okay, and then purchase uh, discount and then the purchase price, is it possible to sometimes buy a home at a discount versus what it's actually worth on the open market, right? Certain scenarios, I mean, it doesn't happen often especially right now, it happens very infrequently right now, but let's go back in time to about 2011, right? Uh, do you guys, any guys in business in 2011, 2010, 2012? Do you guys remember like back then you could drive through a neighborhood and, and about half the neighborhood had a for sale, at least when I was in, on the East Coast, half the neighborhood had a for sale sign in it and you could just pick your property and based on that, uh, if it was a short sale, you could be like, ah, oh, well, I'll buy it if I can get a 40% discount. And by the way, banks were letting them go at that price. Crazy shit was happening back then, but that was the case. And by the way, you could buy it at a 40% discount and you could turn right around and sell it for 40% more if you wanted to. It would take a while because there were so many things that were distressed that were out in the market. But if you just kind of held onto it for a month till like that kind of stuff cleared up, you could totally make money just off of holding onto it for like six months. Put a tenant in there for like a, uh, a year just to break even on it. As soon as all the things cleared up, and then you could sell it for 40% more. It's crazy. Easiest way to make money in the world. Um, anyways, so yeah, sometimes you could get a discount. So you could say, uh, what if I got this place at a 10% discount, right? Which would mean I'd, I could get this place for 2.6. Now for the moment in the current market in LA, very uncommon that that's gonna happen unless you find something off market and you quote like rip off a little old lady scenario, right? Which I hope none of you guys would ever do. The, the, by the way, Gary goes into this in the first few chapters, when that does happen and it does happen sometimes, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're honest and upfront with the people. You're like, hey, look, you know, we could list the property. I could probably get you 3 million for it, but hey, if you're in a hurry, you, you mentioned you need, you, know, you need to get rid of this place and you need somebody to take care of the note or whatever else. I will make this problem go away for you. I can give you $22.6 million right now. And I'll, and you just uh, do a quick deed sale, sale, uh, sale to me. I'll take care of all your problems, make it all go away. And if they say, yes, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. You didn't take advantage of somebody. You told them very upfront, hey, I can, you could get, first of all, you could sell it on your own, make more money. I could sell it for you and you could get more money. Or if you want, I can give you cash now and you could walk away if you want. Like, how they choose to decide that is not your problem. You know, it's not your, and by the way, even if you see them making a stupid decision, as long as you've educated, you know, as long as you're up front with them and say, hey, you know, you could get $3 million if you let me list it. It's going to take a you know, month or so to get, and they're like, no, 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 I'll, 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 if you write me a check, I, I'll, I'll take 2.6 right now. Hey, there's no shame in writing that check. You, you know, you offered them, you, you, you educate, you, there's nothing, what are you going to do? You can't stop them, right? You can't stop people from, from making bad decisions. Okay. Um, okay. So we, we, that's what those three prices are for. So percent down, how does this work? Um, 
typically you're going to need to put as an investor, typical is at least 25% down, right? Now, sometimes I know, well, to get a loan on, you're probably going to want to put at least 25% down. In LA, oftentimes you need to put down 30, 40, 50% just to break even on the property. So it doesn't make sense to, to put less than that. But some people still do and they, and they do a negative cash flow property. I would never do that myself, but some people invest in property, even though it's negative cash flow, thinking, well, within the next five years, I'm sure the rents will go up and then it'll be cash flow positive, right? Hey, I would never do that. Gary does not recommend doing that, but hey, if, if you have a client who wants to do that, like, again, you can't stop people from doing that. Okay, so let's just do 25% right now, and then we'll see how the numbers play out, right? Uh, interest rate. So I just spoke with Chris Rivera right before this meeting, and he said current interest rate for an interest for an investor with 800 credit score uh, looking to put 25% down on a multifamily that he was not, that you're not going to live in one of the units, uh, you're going to get somewhere between a 4.6 and 4.75% interest rate. Not entirely accurate. He didn't like look it up or anything. He was just kind of shooting off the cuff. So this, but whatever. That, um, that for our purposes today, that's going to be good enough. Okay, cost of making repairs. Well, how do you know this? Well, um, so a few things. Uh, one is you could have, you know, first of all, all of us, Gary talks about this a few chapters and he says, we should all be developing relationships with contractors, plumbers, electricians, and all that kind of stuff. So that in scenarios like this, when you see a property, you're thinking about pulling the trigger on it. So what I, what I would probably do is I would go in here first, take a look at the photos, you know, walk through the property myself. I would take an estimate of it right? This property here, I, I, I thought is easily $100,000 worth of repairs. I only know those numbers because I've, I've worked with lots of investors and, and I've seen uh, contractors do it enough to make a rough guess. Is this accurate? No, but we're just going to use it for the moment to rough guesses. If I was getting really serious about it and wanted to pull the trigger, if it's not a super hot mark, like you may not have the time to do it right now, but it if you have the time, I would bring my contractor in and, and have him walk the property and give me his best estimate on what it would take to repair it based on what I tell him. Uh, when I was on the East Coast, I used to have this guy who used to walk the property with me and I would say, you know, give me granite countertops, stainless appliances, but not high end. You know, I would just kind of like paint him the picture of what I was looking for and he'd have a notepad and he would literally write down what, what are we talking about prices, you know. Not enti not entirely accurate to a, to the, to a, you know a decimal point, but it, would, it was always usually good within like five or ten percent. Sometimes high, sometimes low. He, I would always tell him like, please don't like sugarcoat this. Like, give me your honest take, and you know if we end up saving some money, great. And if we end up if we have to spend a little more, okay too, right? So I would encourage you to to find those people in your life. Um. Okay. Any questions so far on this top section here? Let me take a little break here for a second. Look at you guys. Anybody have any questions so far? No, it looks good. All right. Anybody want to add anything to that? No? Okay, let's keep it going. Let's keep the party going here because it is St. Patty's Day. Okay, um, so here's what my mortgage payment is going to look like. Uh, it's telling me here we're looking at a monthly nut of $10,957.77 as what, what am I going to be paying each month annually? This is, this is what my, my expenses are going to be, right? And if you combine the, so here's my down payment amount, 712,000. You combine that with the cost of repairs, that is your total cash in, right? That you add those together and that's down here, total cash in down payment plus repairs. There's where that number comes from. Okay, so far, I have so one, yeah. one question, Simon. Um, I don't think to your total, you added uh, uh, oh, taxes yeah. and property insurance as well. Not yet, not yet. We're, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. Okay. I, uh, I, I entered my name wrong, so I'm Ed Muriel, everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. I'm just, I'm using Simon's uh, Zoom account, which is why uh, I'm showing up as Simon. My uh, mistake, I should have known that. Okay, so, so now we start plugging in some more numbers. So, so the next thing it's asking for is what are, how much rent am I going to take in and how much do I want to plan for vacancy, right? 
So we, oftentimes, if we don't know any better, you want to put about 10% vacancy because you think the between the two units, uh, there's probably going to be vacancy about 10% of the time, possibly. I would say in today's market with the way things are, probably not, I mean, you could go with zero, but if you want to put in 5%, you can, but I would leave it at zero. Like if you end up eating eating a month or two here or there, like so be it, but uh, it's going to be pretty on pretty rare that you're going to be missing a tenant for a, a whole month or two. But, I mean, it's possible. So now we just got to figure out what are the rents. Well, to start, you could start here. So here's what the agent is telling us. The agent is saying that he believes that these properties can rent out for six thousand and fifty-seven fifty. So I'm going to go ahead and use that for the moment. So here on the monthly numbers, I put six thousand. Remember, on this spreadsheet, I mean, you can you can adjust whatever you want, but it's it's built to only type in on the white spaces, and then the yellow spaces get plugged in automatically. They're not sealed, they're not locked. You can go in there and mess with them, but I just want to let you know that that's how it's, it's meant to be used, right? Uh, you can do whatever you want with it, but that's 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 how it was intended to be used. So if that's the case, if this is my monthly income and I have zero vacancy, well then here's my net rental income, projected 11,750 11, annually, that'd be 141,000 on the way in. Question for you guys. Have you ever known a real estate agent to exaggerate anything on the MLS? Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. If they, if they say that the place has tons of curb appeal, does it really have tons of curb appeal? Always. Not always. <laughs> if, they, if they say that it's cozy, does that really mean that it's cozy? You know, you know what I'm saying, right? So... Uh, you could go to a, a website like Rentometer or through Zillow or call, better yet, find a friend who's a property manager like I do and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm getting serious about this property. Can you look at these numbers and tell me if you think these rent numbers are, are accurate? That's the best way. That, you'll, you'll, I, as far as I know, you won't find any better way than asking uh, somebody who does a lot of property management because that's, that's what they do all day long. Me going to them and asking them, what do I think of the rents? is like them asking me, what do I think of a list price, right? Like, hey, we're all experts in our field. Like, don't, don't feel like you need to be an expert in every, your, your, your place of expertise is knowing how to market and sell properties for the highest value and how to get the, the cheapest price and value and how to, how to price property. That's usually what our, our circle of expertise is. If you wanna start going out there and becoming an expert on you know, on flipping properties and all that, great, but just know that you're, that's, that's out of the realm of what we're talking about today. So my recommendation is find experts to do all this stuff for you, you know, and do it accurately. Okay, so let's jump back in here. So now back to what Joseph was saying. Uh, now, we have to, now we have to plug in some, uh, some of the maintenance costs and stuff like that. Property management fees. Well, are we going to manage this property ourselves or not? Because if you are, that's zero, right? That's that's it, and and zero leasing costs. Anybody want to say what is the difference between property management fees and leasing costs in this in this scenario? May want to take a crack at it. Is the leasing cost that you get to the other agents when you? Uh, leasing the property for maybe more than a year and property management is we pay someone to take care of all the necessities such as repair and collecting uh, payments and all that stuff. So uh, uh, let me put it this way is that sort of you're on the right track at least and 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 this is possibly what you meant so let me this is this is how I interpret it property management fees are the fees you, you pay to somebody to manage the property on a monthly, on a month to month basis, basis, somebody has a leaky faucet, they're not calling me, they're calling them. So when someone's faucet's leaking, who do they call? If they're calling me, then zero property management fees. I am the property manager. And by the way, you should, if you're going to manage your own property, it's not free. 
right? What, it, what What's the cost? Time. Time. And is our time valuable? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I had a coach who used to say, figure out how much you made last year and uh, divide it. There's a number you divide it by. And that's how many, that's how much you make per hour. And if you can find somebody to do any particular job cheaper than that, then you should have them do it. And you should be doing what you're doing. That's making you whatever amount you're making per hour. That's a, that's a good way to look at it, isn't it? Uh, typically, like if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're making about $50 an hour. Now, some of us work more hours and all that kind of stuff. There's ways of calculating that. Um, but that's a, that's a good rule of thumb, right? Uh, Gary Keller's all about that too. He says, you know, hey, if you want to mow your own lawn, great. Not, if, if you take pride in it, something you enjoy doing, knock yourself out, man, that's awesome. But just know that you are, you're, it's, you are the gardener, you know? You are, you know, you, whatever job you're doing in that moment, that's, that's the job you are. You are the babysitter, you are the, you know, and, and some things we want to do, Right. And, and so we want to do them, even though we're, that's not a money-making proposition, but, uh, but that's a good way of looking at it when it comes to anything business oriented. Again, I digress a little bit. So property management fees, that's, that's what we pay someone on a monthly ongoing basis. Leasing costs is what is it going to, what's the cost of putting a tenant in the property, which usually the, usually it's the same person who does both, but as a real estate agent, you could decide, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of the leasing costs. I'm going to find the tenant and put them in there. But once I have them in there, I'm going to have somebody else taking care of the property management because I don't want to be, I don't want getting calls at three in the morning for, with leaky faucets and whatever else, right? Totally up to you. And you could do it all or do, or do neither. Um, but whatever it is, that's what we put here for the moment. Let's just say we're, we're, we're going to, we're not going to do either one of them. Hey, I had a quick question on leasing costs. Yes. Would that, would that include some like tenant turnover if uh, you need to update the carpets or, you know, whatever it is, do any updates before, no. before re-renting it? So again, great. That's, a, that's an awesome question. And I think it's kind of up to you to decide. So whatever, whatever the expenses that needs to be accounted for, uh, would you put it as a leasing cost or would you put that as a maintenance cost? Personally, I would, count, I would consider that a maintenance cost. Uh, fixing up the unit between, between tenants, right? Because there's always gonna be some maintenance to be done. Hopefully I, I've saved up enough in my, in my little maintenance stockpile to, to take care of that expense. Otherwise it's coming out of pocket. I personally, I wouldn't consider that a leasing cost. I would consider that a maintenance cost. In fact, I think it's most people would do that, would, would consider that a, a maintenance cost. Because you're because technically you're not, it's not a cost of getting a tenant. It's a cost of fixing up the property. Now, if you're marketing, to find a tenant, if you're staging the property to, to find a tenant, right? Staging is, is different. You're, that's not ongoing. That, that disappears the minute a tenant is found. You know, for a high-end property, something like that with like, a, you know, could you ever stage something that's that's a lease? I, you could, something like that. So th those would be more leasing costs. Uh, but but uh, anything that you do just to maintain the property between tenants, replace carpet, that's, that's just maintenance, in, in my opinion. Yeah, it makes sense. It, it, I had one point to make. Uh, in terms of acquiring the property, it's probably good if you acquire it under LLC because you want to put that in case if there's any liability issues. And also, if you're renting it, um, don't forget to get renter's insurance. So having it under LLC is best to protect your assets. Great point. Absolutely, Joseph. We, yeah, we talked about that a few times in, in this call. Yeah, absolutely. great point. You can never say it enough times. Yeah, when you buy a property, especially a, uh, something like this, I would highly recommend putting it in an LLC. And also, uh, you may want to do an S corp, depending on what the income is going to be and all that. They say that when you're when the income is over fifty thousand uh, dollars, that's what that's what uh, an attorney that sets up S corps. That, that's what they told me. Once you once you're past fifty thousand dollars worth of income per year, that's when it, it, the line gets drawn where it becomes. Uh, be, truly beneficial to, to form an S corp with that, right? Uh, side note, by the way, LLCs are not free in California. Most states are free. Like there's no maintenance. I mean, other than setting it up, there's no maintenance cost to it. California has a weird fee where I, I oh, it's a $300, right? Uh, annually. I know. Uh, I believe it's $300 annually that you pay to maintain just, just, just to have an, uh, an LLC. So you'll want to factor that in as well. Um, okay. Good stuff. 
so, you know, what does it cost typically to, for property management for leasing costs? I've been told like in, in the Bay Area, if you're going to do something locally here, to, to, uh, if you calculate like five or 6% for property management, you're probably going to be fine. Um, but I've also seen, I, I know one guy who manages property for $99 a month, and he makes most of his money on the leasing costs on acquiring the tenants. So, you know, shop around because the, the rates vary wildly. And, uh, you know, so, uh, ask around any other comments on that. Okay, here's another one that's a, a great one. Uh, maintenance reserve. How much do we want to be putting away in maintenance every year for this property? Now, that's a really good question. And, and this one is, is tricky. And I don't know that I have the answer for this particular property. Let's, you know, let's look at this property again. What do we think? Like, assuming that, where am I at? This little duplex by the beach here, right? What do I think on an annual basis am I going to be spending to keep this place up and maintaining it, keeping it up to date? A couple thousand is that is that probably a good amount? I would say that's I would say it's probably at least a couple thousand, maybe three thousand. Anyone want to take a guess at that? Any any opinions on there? I'm just guessing. I I don't really know. Would it be Would it be better to go off of a percent of the? Uh, well, I guess we're trying to get to the percent that we want to take, but yeah, I'm not sure. You know, one thing you can always do too is you can ask the current uh, owner if they have rent rolls and, and just see what their maintenance, uh, if, they, if they mind showing you their P&L. Uh, there's no harm in asking. You won't always get it. In fact, you will, I would say, probably get it less than half the time. But, you know, I would start there ask them like, hey, you know, what, what have your maintenance fees been uh, for the last five, 10 years? If you mind if you mind sharing that with me. Ed, may I make one point again? Yeah, um, no, just... Thank you. Uh, it's okay. Uh, when you acquire a property uh, for business, make sure you understand that it's not Section 8 and there's no cap on the lease for future. So there's a positive, you can get a positive cash flow. Yeah. Um, just, just make sure that's in your favor. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but currently you have to know in, in Southern California, there's a lot of Section 8s. And also there's a lot of rent caps. Super good point. And yes, that's one of the things that makes me, uh, those of you guys who are on this call know that I'm not a fan of investing in California. Uh, I'm looking to invest in Nevada myself here in the next year. Uh, and that's probably the number one reason why is because, uh, because of the, the law around here is uh, not, is uh, a bit restricted when it comes to being a landlord. I, I wouldn't say I would never invest in California, but I would say just it's part of the equation that's that's pushing me to invest in in Nevada um, or just anywhere outside of California, really. Uh, but yeah, that's a great point. Make definitely make sure you take into account rent. Make sure you know the rent control laws, the Section Eight laws. Definitely things you want, and just other things too, like local ordinances. Just you know you. I know a lot of people are putting in offers now with uh, no contingencies and all that, but especially when you're an investor, like you need to check out like all the, whatever's going on with the property. There's so many things that can go wrong that will just completely F your, 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 your ability to make money off this property. And you got to know that stuff. I, I just, I could never imagine buying a property with no, with no contingencies right now. If I didn't know all the detail about the property, you know, all the just, you know, all, all the legal ramifications, you know, is, is there like a, a, a private uh, a transfer fee on the property? Like just stuff like that. You got to know all this stuff. I have one more point to make because I was helping some investors. When you acquire a property, if it's older, you want to read the deed, make sure there's no rest restrictions on the deed, maybe 50, 100 years ago, because if there are restrictions on the deed, you might not be able to what you want. If you want to rebuild it or get tenants out, there may be restrictions on the deed. So please read the deed on prior and the prior um, transfer. So you make sure there's no restriction on that for you. Yeah, great point. And, and if you're planning on flipping a property, then it gets even more crazy because you really want to know, make sure that what you want to build on the property is doable, right? Uh, there's laws in, in Hermosa Beach and Manhattan Beach, how, how high you can go with the property. 
there's, you know, setbacks, there's so, there's so many things that can limit you and you really got to know what you're doing. So you may want to talk to an architect, uh, at least a contractor who knows the area very well, if nothing else. Right. So yeah, good stuff. Hey, Ed, I have a question. Yeah, Luis. Hey, how are you guys? Hey, Ed, um, why Nevada? What is the secret? Tell us why Nevada? Um, no secret much at all. We, we had JT Taylor on here. Who's a friend of mine out in, uh, in uh, uh, Las Vegas, and uh, what's the name of the place right next door to it that I like? <sighs> Henderson, Henderson, Nevada. Uh, and he was just telling us, you know, the, I like that the property values are, are low there right now, like low comparable to here. I like that it's near Las Vegas, which is, is very easy to go travel to. You know, who doesn't like going to Vegas two or three times a year to go check on your property? And hey, while you're, first of all, it makes your trip to Nevada totally tax deductible as far as I'm concerned. And then, uh, I don't know, ask, ask your accountant about that, by the way. Don't take my word for it. I, I do a lot of shit that's tax, tax deductible that you probably, your accountant may not agree with. Um, can, I, can I make one more point? Um, the fact that you mentioned Nevada, it, you may not want to lease it all the time. You may want to consider if that property, you can do Airbnb. Yep. That may be possibly better for you in terms of long run, in terms of pricing. Yeah, and there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that go into making that. Just we're, we're let, let's hey Joseph, we're we're gonna put a pin in that. We're not let's not talk about Airbnb right now because that's there, there's a lot of dis, uh, details that go into making that decision. But you're absolutely right that that's something you can do uh, e easier in Nevada is Airbnb a property, and a lot of times you're gonna end up better off, you know. Because uh, I had some uh, friends there that are doing. I didn't mean to talk about it. I just want to make the point so is and yeah. people know about it. Absolutely. And, and uh, the other thing I like about Henderson, Nevada is uh, Las Vegas is not just for gambling anymore. They got a football team. They have a basketball team, a hockey team, right? Basketball, I think basketball. There's a college nearby. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff there for people to want to rent there. And Henderson, uh, I was there for my son's baseball tournament last uh, Thanksgiving, and it's a really nice town. And uh, one that, I, you know, it's, it's a place that I was dri driving around going like, oh, I could totally see living here and I could see this place expanding. So that, that's what draws me to it. You know, those are, and, but the biggest reasons are the, the price, the fact that people that I trust say it's really easy to rent out the property there and they don't see that changing anytime soon. It's easy to cash flow on the, like when you do the numbers, like it's easier to cash flow on the property with 20% down than it is to do here. And um, the, the laws are, are far less restrictive than here. Like, you know, Tenants not paying you a victim, like that simple. Like get them the hell out of your property. Like you, hey, you you pay, you stay. You 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 don't, you go. Like like you know, there's no there's no shame in that of, of when you tell a tenant, hey, we're gonna sign a lease. If you don't pay the lease, I'm going to kick you out. <laughs> you know that, that that's what it always was for the longest time. It's only in LA that it's like you know you sign a lease and you're like, well, I'll think about paying. And you know. Um, yeah, I don't feel like paying this month. And no, you can't kick me out, honestly. And in fact, you can't kick me out anytime for like the next three years or, you know how it is. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point. And I, and I love LA and I'm not saying that, and I understand why some of these laws were passed. I'm just saying that from an investor point of view, it's less restrictive and more landlord friendly in Nevada from my point of view, that is maybe not the most perfect point of view or, or the most educated, but it seems like that to me. Okay, we're, we are off on a tangent, but I love it. It's a fun tangent. Okay, let's go back to our property because we need to we need to wrap this thing up here pretty soon. Okay, so here's our property. Okay, so what is my maintenance cost? Let's plug in $3,000. That's probably pretty accurate. Utilities. Now, this is a duplex. I shouldn't really ever be paying utilities. The only time I'd be paying utilities if it's, if it's going to be vacant for a while. So I, I think I'm pretty good to say that it's going to be zero utilities right? Um, may have to pay for water, but let's just not worry about that detail. Uh, again, just know that sometimes the landlord pays for the water and, and includes that as part of the rent. It's totally up to you. Property taxes. So good rule of thumb. We know that in California, when you buy a property, it resets the property tax, right? To what? Anybody remember? 1.25%? Technically it's 1%, but there's always a bunch of added little decorations on the tax bill to, to put it about 1.15, 1.2, is that about right? Somewhere in there. 
<coughs> so let's go 1.2 on this property. 2850 times 1.02. Let's say 2%. That's $57,000. I'm sorry, wait, no, 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 1.12, sorry. 2850 times 1, 1.2%. There we go, 0. 0.012. That's 34,200 in property taxes. Oh, let me share my screen again so you guys can follow along. Insurance. Joseph was absolutely right. We want to make sure we have good renter's insurance on this property. I don't. I have no idea what to put here. Uh, uh, I wish that uh, David was on this call because he's always so good at that. He, he used to be uh, in insurance. From my prior, from our prior times talking to him, I, what we would say like fifteen hundred dollars, isn't that about right? Somebody, does that, does that sound about right for this duplex here? Sounds about right. And do we do we foresee any other costs on this? We've got HOA fees, no. Lawn care, no. Trash, I don't think so. Um, so I think we're probably good zero. So this is probably a pretty good estimate on this property right here. How is this thing gonna perform if you put down 25%? And so what do we have as the bottom line? Well, it's not good. This property is gonna lose about $30,000 a year. It's probably why it's sitting on the market because, so to make this thing cash flow positive, we would have to put down more money. So let's see how much do we have to put down? 30%? Nope. 40%? Getting close. 45? You'd have to put down 45%, which is 1.282 to make this thing break even. And to some people, that might be a good investment. I mean, some people might say, oh yeah, I've got 1.2, I got I've I've got 1.3 million uh, sitting in the bank. That I this sounds like a good investment to eat. I, we're not here to argue with them. We're just here to show them the numbers. And be like, hey, by the way, here's here's what your here's what I believe that your investment is going to look like. And over time, this is what it's going to look like. By the way, cash on cash. You know, you put this amount cash on cash. This column here on this on page two is that it's just looking at cash flow. I'm putting down 1.3 million dollars, and I'm getting back what in return? Uh, what do we say? Cash flow is five thousand dollars. That's a zero, it's basically break even. It's a zero percent cash flow. Now, over time, you'll note that rent is going to go up over time. It calculates that. And so my cash flow over time, not, not accumulated cash flow, annual annual net cash flow, this number here, it's going to go up over time because rents are going to go up, right? Which is why the cash on cash is always going to go up little by little by little. The total ROI factors in what we project to be appreciation along with the cash flow. It's all said and done. When all is said and done, what is the ROI on this property in the first year? We estimate this to be 11%. Now on this front page here, back to the front page, down at the bottom, it says some assumptions. What do we think the appreciation rate is gonna be? A good rule of thumb is 4.4% because that's what the 20 year average has been nationally. Now I know some of you guys have even been paying attention, the appreciation in the beach cities over the last, you know, anywhere in Southern California over the last 10 years has been much higher than that. I would caution you into using numbers higher than 4.4%. You may want to, your client may want to, but just be careful. Like if it's your own property, uh, I know we've been appreciating like crazy, but that's not entirely sustainable. It does not look to be. So just be careful with that. In my opinion, all this is in my opinion. Um, but Again, this is up to you to figure out what do you want to do with these numbers. This book that we've been reading through is going to help you know what numbers to plug in here and stuff. But this, as far as using the using the tool of this worksheet, this is, and by the way, I'm going to put this analysis that we just did right here. I'm going to put this on the Facebook page uh, here today. All right. What ahas or questions do we have? I know, I mean, there's so many things to talk about like this. There's, there's an endless conversation. But as far as using the actual form, anybody have questions on how to use the actual form? That's a pretty simple form to use. So yeah, it's good. I will tell you, like when I look at this, you know, like as far as like, if anyone of you guys is thinking like, is this a good investment? I don't think so. I think it's a shitty investment, honestly. You're putting down, 
first of all, if you put down 25%, your cash flow negative, you have to put down 45% down just to break, just to make no money, just to like break even. I mean, you're going to make money off of appreciation, but I, I am all about the cash flow. I love the cash flow. I don't care about, in fact, I honestly don't even care about the appreciation. I just want cash flow all day long. And my kids will worry when I, when I'm long dead and gone, they'll worry about the appreciation. That's how I look at it. That's my little philosophy, right? So I know I could buy, a, I could buy shit for, excuse my language, for $2.8 million, let's say for $3 million, we're talking about Henderson, Nevada, right? I could buy 10 single family homes in Henderson, Nevada for $300,000 a pop. Appreciation, probably going to be about the same rate over historically, if I hold on to this thing for 20 years, probably going to be a, roughly the same appreciation rate, in my opinion. But I can put 20% down on each one of those things and be cash flow positive right from the get go. I don't know uh, with the current interest rate if that's still the case, but last time I checked, that was still possible. So yeah, yeah. I, would, I would rather buy a boatload of property in Nevada for that same $1.3 million than, rather than buying this place for one, this one place that ba barely breaks even for 1.3. Ed, may I make one point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you buy three properties in Nevada versus one property in um, at the local near beach area, you're actually spreading your odds. So if you don't have tenants for a while, you don't have any income coming in and you may be out of pocket for a long time. But if you're in Nevada, you're actually spreading your odds by more than one property. Yeah, I mean, th there's there's many reasons, you know, the, the reasons for owning one property is because, hey, it's, it's, it's simpler, right? It's less headaches, less, it's, you know, you're going to have less maintenance uh, probably, but I, I'll, I'll, Hey, if I can factor that into the, into the, if I can factor in the maintenance cost into it and I have a property manager, I don't care. Right. I just, all I care about is where am I going to cash flow better? That's all I care about. And again, some people are all about the appreciation and they love having a property in Redondo beach or, or Manhattan beach. Cause they want to air. They, they may have different calculations of what they want to do. Mine is very straightforward. I just want cash flow, and that's all I care about. Period. You know. Uh, but you think you think that there is a bad uh, investment because it's too expensive? No, no. It's it's not Please, about the way price. Expensive. It's not. It's not about the price. It's about the the net. Or if if we did these numbers. Yeah. Why is bad? It's about it's, uh, Why is about? Investment. That's what I. I do have to. I do have to wrap it up here. But but here, let's let's. Let's say this was a triplex and let's say there's another unit that rents out for $20,000 a month. I know it makes no sense, but let's, and I can get it for this price. Uh, if I go on to page two, now my net ROI is 30%. And now my cash on cash is 18%. First of all, that's crazy. <laughs> that's like, that'd be, that'd be like a freaking unicorn. But let's say you could find that. Yes, this is an awesome, awesome investment right here, even though it's the same price. It just, the only, it has to do with these two numbers here. What is my total ROI and what is my cash on cash? Really, those are all the numbers I care about, really. Uh, as long as my calculations are all correct up front, that's really all I care about. And the bottom, I mean, this, it's funny. I didn't understand for a long time, but I have, I have some really wise investor friends. And I used to talk to them about, you know, on this front page, you see, I've got cap rate and gross rent multiplier. And I used to think those were like, you know, really cool terms to throw around. And all they would care about is give me the cash on cash. And I'd be like, you know, and that's all they cared about. And, the, and now I kind of, now that I'm like, I'm getting to that point, I can kind of understand where they were coming from. Hey, Ed, can you go back to the, to uh, the first page? Yeah. Maybe this will make sense and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Luis, you, you mentioned, you know, why is this a bad deal, right? So just kind of one, we're putting down, we, on this calculation, we put down 25%, right? That, that means we're, putting down we, we put down 45 percent of this one. 40, 45 45 so you were putting down how much now it's 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.2 1. 1.3 million right our total in is about 1.4 million so 1.4 all the way in right and then if you look if you're looking at your monthly mortgage payment it's at eight thousand, right that's your mortgage and if you're looking at or is it uh, your without the unit C, right? You're already paying net rental income is eleven thousand seven fifty. So in that case, you're up three, right? Three thousand. But then you have all these total expenses down yeah, here. You, 
your net cash flow is basically, you know, I, I just kept putting more money down until it right. was basically cash flow. Right. Originally, we had put down 25%, right? And that 25%, we were negative cash flow, right? So that means, Luis, we would have to be putting that negative money out of our pocket until 11 years afterwards when it appreciates, which we're not, you know, really caring for appreciation at this point. We want cash flow because we're, we're analyzing this property for rental purposes, not for us to buy and hold. Exactly. Hey guys, no, but I'm saying it's too expensive. Hey, the property is too expensive. That's what I think. It doesn't work. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's why it hasn't. It's, no one's it's not about it. money, put him down money. I think it's just way too expensive. And actually in the MLS, the price is going down in that yeah. property. You see it. So I want to see how much it was before. I bet hey guys, you, can, you can offer some, some another. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have to go ahead. Guys, okay. I, I have a four o'clock call I have to be on, but you know what we'll do? Let's hold on to this. And next week, we're going to look at some properties in Henderson, Nevada. And let's, this is what $1.3 million buys you in, in Manhattan Beach. Yeah, I want to see that. Let, let's see what, what you could buy in Henderson, Nevada for $1.3 million. And I bet you. It, let's I see how it compares. You. And what I'm going to do is I'll just find like one property and, and just assume that I can buy like four of them at the same price. And we'll analyze one and we'll see how it works out. Sound good, Beautiful. you guys? Great. Quick Thank question, you. Ed. Have yes. you ever looked at Texas? I have, you know, I, I've actually bought many property in Texas. That's uh, my, my whole, I used to invest in, in debt in Texas. I've, I've bought like, I flipped like a dozen properties there. I used to own a bunch. Uh, my brother- You're not lives holding there. and why. renting it out? Yeah, yeah it, I love Texas. Uh, in fact, my brother-in-law lives there and I, I will probably buy some more in Texas here at some point. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Thank no, you it's, so it's a, much. It's a great place. And maybe we'll look there next week. Maybe we'll, we'll look in debt in Texas. I can show you like, some of the properties cool. like around where I used to own. Awesome. Thank you, Ed. Take care, Thank guys. Thank you very much, Ed. Right. Have, Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.